Today's lecture is going to be on the Assyrian literary movement in Iraq and Iran. Now, what are we talking about when we talk about Assyrian literature? We're talking about poetry, and poetry has various qualities, obviously. We don't need to go into detail about what poetry is. Um, this is just helpful to understand, but there are various types of uh, poetry or subgenres, you could say. Epic poetry, such as Gilgamesh and Qatina, which we will refer to today. A narrative uh, storytelling type of poetry, such as Ashur Betsergis's poem, Giptet Anwe, um, uh, Grapes, um, uh, Grape Plant, um, which tells a story, uh, a love story of um, uh, two lovers who um, one is, uh, has passed away and is recalling and speaking through the grapevine. Um, now that's what the, the poem is, grapevine, I should say. So it's a narrative story. Uh, lyric poetry, um, there are many of these in, in Assyrian literature. There are many songs that, are, uh, that express powerful emotions concerning the nation. For example, Nineveh, which I will quote from today by William Daniel, Khazade by Givergis Arasi, Awara by uh, Daniel Benjamin, which has been sung by um, Iwan Agassi. Uh, Nineveh has been performed by various uh, uh, people, and it is one of the iconic Assyrian songs um, that is rec constantly recognized, very much recognized. Um, I remember listening to it as a child when we first came to Chicago. It was one of the songs that uh, that always began a radio program, a Syrian radio program in, in Chicago in 1973, so many years ago. Then we have fiction, and there are various uh, works of fiction among Assyrians. Uh, there is, for example, uh, Mishael Lazar Isa's Khamis Libbet Prizla. It is a story sort of unique because we don't have much in this type of literature. There are poems and writings of Shmuel Bitkolia. Um, there is a, um, a story, a fictional story of, uh, I think the book is called Sapart Kashisha Sliwu Shmeya. It's a, the story of a, an Assyrian priest who goes to heaven and he is exploring um, the Old Testament. He has a lot of questions about it. It's a sort of a critical book of the Old Testament. Um, there are realistic uh, stories, uh, such as historical realistic, Khazukham al Ubqa by Binyamin Gindilu and others. Uh, there are fables, metle, what we call as metle. Um, and there's various mythological uh, works, such as Qatina and Gilgamesh, which you know fall into different categories, but um, uh, one could say they're fiction and in the category of mythology. There are many non-fiction uh, writings uh, among Assyrians during this period. There are autobiographies, there are biographies, uh, and there are essays. And in each category, some, some books veer into, for example, an autobiography also talks about the experience of that person uh, for example, in a political movement or in a church uh, uh, setting or so on. Then there's drama as well. And Assyrian drama has been um, a staple for many of the nationalists who, such as Freydun uh, Aturaya and Benjamin Ersanis, who wrote uh, dramas to sort of um, encapsulate their views about nationalism and to teach Assyrians about uh, the nationalist efforts. And these occurred early in the 1920s and uh, Assyrians actually translated uh, a lot of works of Shakespeare, for example. Um, my, my own father was uh, the ghost in Hamlet in one of these plays. And I recall as a child being shown a photograph of my father uh, being wrapped in a mummy uh, suit in Kirkuk and that was in the 1950s, I believe. And um, I didn't see it in the 1950s. I saw it later, obviously. 
Um, the Merchant of Venice has been translated, um, and there you see in, in the Assyrian language, Drama et Tajr et Venice. Drama Tajr et Venice. So various Assyrians were involved. Um, one of them was Rabi Akhtiyar bin Yamin, who you see here to the right, and uh, um, uh, I forget the name of the uh, actual the writer. Uh, well, why don't we look at the description here and and um, see it? And it is uh, Abrimun Abraham. Abrimun Abraham or Oraham was the director. And Rabi Akhtiyar bin Yamin was, uh, I believe, co-director. Rabi Akhtiyar bin Yamin is another man of literature who has written extensively. He wrote in uh, a number of books and wrote in a number of uh, periodicals, uh, including the uh, Church of the East periodical, which appeared in Chicago uh, for a number of years, a number of decades, in fact. Um, well, when we talk about Assyrian literature, it's very important to discuss really what happened to get to the modern age or prior to the modern age. And it's often viewed as sort of, Assyrian literature is viewed as starting with the arrival of the missionaries, modern Assyrian literature, why is that? And so Yoab bin Yamin in his uh, book, Studies in Language and Literature, which was published posthumously, meaning after his death, um, this book, talks about why this period of time is sort of difficult to trace until the arrival of the missionaries. So the devastating sweep of the Mongols under Genghis Khan and Tamerlane inflicted horrific injury on the Assyrians. And uh, so this is the reason why Assyrian literature was very difficult to come by. And of course, knowing the conditions, and we've discussed in class, the difficult conditions that Assyrians lived under whether it was the Safavids early on in Iran and then the Qajars, uh, although during the Qajar period, when the missionaries came in, things were uh, better. But during the Safavids, for example, and then during the times of the various uh, Ottoman rulers and the particular geography of the Hakkari, for example, and even Turabdin made life extremely difficult. And so literature was not one of the things that Assyrians excelled in during these uh, times that Rabi Yo bin Yamin refers to as the dark ages of Assyrian literature. However, it's important to know that Assyrian literature was kept alive by priests and bishops and so on who and other people clerics who kept manuscripts and uh, had really uh, taken care of manuscripts much like uh, Jewish scholars take care of the Torah um, with much care and they they really treasured um, this type of literature and thought it was the most important thing that they had and uh, so so there were many books who were, which were passed on. Uh, these happened to be mostly, although not exclusively, mostly works of uh, classical uh, Assyrian or classical Syriac. And uh, they were religious works. Either it was the Khudra, the Bible, and there were also um, Sparsamane, uh, which were Sparsamane are uh, books on, um, one could say, um, medicine, herbal medicine of sorts, and magic, magical uh, potions, and so on. Witchcraft. So themes of modern Assyrian literature, as Assyrians developed their modern literature after the arrival of the missionaries, and we will talk about that, they developed these this, this literature developed in the following categories, religious, linguistics, or many dictionaries, for example. Uh, there were journalistic efforts, and we'll, we'll refer to uh, various periodicals. Uh, there was political literature, such as the Urmia Manifesto, uh, historical uh, literature, which, which came uh, during the time of the missionaries and also later, 
There were many uh, translation uh, works, of course. There's romantic literature, looking at history um, through an emotional eye, uh, much tragic literature and nostalgic literature. And I will refer to a lot of the nostalgic literature that has pervaded many of Assyrian folk songs and modern poetry because it reflects the Assyrian experience. Even though modern Assyrian literature really begins with the arrival of the missionaries, it's important to point out that modern writing, so different from what we know as classical Syriac, so, so our Eastern, what is called as Eastern Assyrian or, or Suadaya, was beginning um, to be written in the 16th century. And the works of Alessandro um, Mengozi, an Italian scholar of, of Syriac um, or, or, or of Neo-Aramaic, Neo if you will. And these are focuses on uh, Joseph uh, of Tilkepe and Israel of al -Qush, two scholars. Uh, Assyrian scholars from the 16th century who are focused on what we call durukiyata, which are, or durukiyate, which are um, short literary creations, um, uh, a verse, uh, poetic verse, and they are largely religious. So, for example, uh, quoting from, from the work of um, Joseph of Tilkepe, in the day in which the high king makes resurrection, so Yumit Qiyamta, and raises his friends to the kingdom of heaven, Melkutit Shmeya. May you be at the right hand of our Lord, O Christian people. So he's wishing all Christian people to be at the right hand of the Lord, and humbly, he says, and at the end, after all of you, me, poor miserable Joseph. The end of this homily, glory be to God, amen. This is a very familiar expression that is in the constant, um, um, in, the, in all of the literary works of these durukyate among uh, Assyrians during this time. So the time of the American missionaries, this is a very interesting time. It really lights the fire of uh, creativity and, and the creation of much literature and at the center of this is Dr. Justin Perkins, who came to Urmia very early on in the 19th century, worked on the Assyrian dialect of Urmia. And this is one of the reasons why when you read the Assyrian, modern Assyrian today, modern Eastern Assyrian, it is largely centered on the Urmia dialect. Of course, there are changes uh, especially with the writings of uh, people like Yo Binyamin and his brother Daniel Binyamin, who wrote extensively in the Journal of the Assyrian Academic Society. There are changes to this, but by and large, the very basis uh, of the modern Assyrian language of the Eastern Assyrian language, which is really the most prolific, it was centered on the dialect of Urmia. So not on the dialect of any of the dialects of the Hakkari. Now, this doesn't mean it's not understood, of course, but it means that this is where the American missionaries settled, and this is where much of the writing was done very early on in the uh, 19th century. So uh, Perkins was also helped, it's important to remember, by various Assyrians, such as Tasha Raham of uh, Guitapa, Dinha Ishu of Gawar, Mario Hannan, Bishop uh, of Urmia from Gawilan, and Shamasha uh, Ishaq and Tammu, uh, also from Urmia. These pioneers helped work out the very first um, uh, orthographical and grammatical rules for the modern spoken Assyrian. At the time of his arrival, there were about only 40 Assyrians who were literate, along with the sister of the patriarch, and many of these people were associated with the church. So very important to know the role of the church, again, in preserving. And, and when we say church, 
we really do mean all of the Assyrian churches, whether it's the Syriac Orthodox, the Chaldean Church, the Church of the East, and the Syriac Catholics, of course. And prior to the arrival of the missionaries, there was also work being done on, on modern Assyrian literature, although not as extensive as it was done by the American missionaries because of the view of Protestants. Uh, remember, when you have um, Martin Luther uh, coming and complaining of the Bible being in Latin and not understood, that Protestant way of thinking, of making things clear, making the holy books clear to most people, pervaded American thinking. And it was very important that the Bible would be translated uh, into the modern Assyrian and that modern Assyrian would take on a life of its own separate and apart from the religious uh, classical or what was known as Lishana Tika, although it's not much Tika than or old than what we know as the modern Assyrian. It's just that the modern Assyrian was written more recently and worked on more recently. So the work done on the classical was done long ago and it was kept in the, among the Assyrian people and then the modern is a more recent uh, language that has been written. Although again, there were references to Yosef of Tilkepe and uh, Israel of al in the 16th century. But by and large, the, the efforts of the American missionaries really triggered what we know as modern Assyrian literature. And Assyrians began to really love uh, to read and schools grew. Um, there were over um, 200 schools in, in the area of Urmia. And of course, by school, we don't mean necessarily a very large schools. Many of these were village schools, but literacy spread like wildfire in Urmia. And the missionaries also um, achieved uh, some great accomplishments, which was a uh, creation of books of grammar, uh, one of which was created in uh, 1895 in Cambridge, and that's the grammar of the dialects of vernacular Syriac, and it was also called Syriac at that time, or dialects of vernacular Syriac in Oxford in 1901. And these books are indispensable um, for uh, readers of um, people who love modern Assyrian literature. So the American missionaries initiated um, what we know as modern Assyrian literature and began the publication of the very first periodical in all of Iran uh, in 1849, uh, and possibly throughout the Middle East. Uh, this was the very first periodical, and it was, it's really incredible to, to view this uh, uh, creation, this, this um literary creation of Assyrians working with Americans. It is basically a genuine newspaper, one of uh, that, that um, is reflecting what is going on in the lives of Assyrians in Urmia and not necessarily only in Urmia, but also throughout the world talking about uh, the country of Iran, um, giving lessons, religious uh, lessons in, in uh, faith and so on, and uh, being a, uh, one of the earliest newspapers in the country. So Zarirat Bahra starts in 1849, Qalit Shrara in 1897, Urmi Orthodoxeta uh, around 1895, and that is being uh, prompted by the Orthodox, Russian Orthodox Church, and many Assyrians do convert to the Russian Orthodox Church. Kichwa, the very first, I would say, secular and nationalist, uh, purely nationalist, although there are references in Zarir al-Bahra to nationalism or to the idea of the nation. Nevertheless, Kichwa becomes really the first nationalist effort, uh, literary effort by the Assyrians in 1906. And then Naqusha, published in 1915 by Binyamin Arsanis. These are some of the periodicals that appeared. Um, and uh, the periodicals that appeared later 
really um, were the efforts of people who were extremely nationalistic, who were very nationalistic and wanted to seek a solution that was uh, oriented towards the nation uh, at this time. So the Assyrian nationalist movement flowers, and it is really a essentially a literary movement. Uh, people like Freydun Aturaya, Benjamin Arsanis, Baba Parhad, Yohanan Mushe, whose picture you see here, and others uh, begin this movement. And uh, their, fo their focus is largely and strictly on uh, literary efforts, educating people. The First World War disrupts this period in time, this very critical uh, period for the Assyrians and throws everything into disarray. And many of the people, the educated people among the Assyrians either are forced to abandon their homes or they are killed in the Assyrian genocide of the First World War. Among them, Martu Madarmu, Mar ad Deshir, and others all across the Assyrian landscape, which is today spanning from Iran, from what is Lake Ormia, all the way into the area of Syria, so into Turkey, into Syria, and into Iraq. Well, the Assyrians weren't going to let something like the First World War get in the way of attempting again to um, put things together and build their literature once more. So literature becomes, um, the message in literature becomes subtle and symbolic. Themes are various references to ancient and glorious history of the Assyrians, the tragic events of recent history, the First World War, and then later uh, the various experiences of, of Assyrians in the 1920s and, um, and everything that stemmed from that the maintenance of culture, of customs, of language, and community cohesion. In Iraq, Reverend Yosef Paleta establishes the Assyrian school in Mosul in 1921. In 1933, the Semele massacre causes fear and panic among Assyrians in Iraq, and this leads to an even more subtle and symbolic way of expressing oneself, especially when it came to political matters for the Assyrians. In Iran, the literary movement flowers during the 1940s and later. Now, Assyrians in Iran did not have the same type of government to contend with as in Iraq, which was necessarily more repressive and was going to become more repressive later and persecute Assyrians in very violent ways, uh, as well as subtle ways. Um, but, so Iran was different. So there was more of an opportunity and uh, the Assyrians in Iran, in particular, Sita Sapreta, to which I will refer, uh, Sita Sapreta, the literary committee, known as the literary committee, uh, not only created more literature, but created a sort of worldwide nationalistic movement that gave rise to political uh, efforts in the form of the Assyrian Universal Alliance and later others. So speaking of the Assyrian school in 1921, it operated from 1921 to 1945. It produced really the next generation of Assyrian leaders and intellectuals. The school began in November uh, on November 1st and ended on May 30th. The school was co-ed with boys and girls, although you don't see many of the girls in this particular photograph, but there are others. Uh, according to Shamasha Yosef Zaya um, of Nara, there were many girls, but only some made it to advanced classes. In 1921, a disagreement between Benjamin Ersanis, who also taught in the school, and Reverend Yosef Paleta arose regarding the curriculum. Benjamin Ersanis wanted to stress history and science more, particularly Assyrian history, and wanted a more secular curriculum, while Kasha Paleta wanted a more religious curriculum. Marshamun sided with as you can possibly guess with the priest, but it's important to remember that Reverend Yosef Paleta or Di Kaleta took his students to various sites and educated them as to the origins of the Assyrians. And here we see a photograph 
of Reverend uh, Yosef Paleta with his students. And there you see Shamashi Giorgis Bet Benyamin, to whom I will refer uh, in the next few slides. Um, these students all became later teachers, or virtually all became teachers, and knew how to read and write, not only in Assyrian and in English, and many attributed their knowledge of the English language, the Arabic language, and the uh, Assyrian language to the efforts of Qashio Sabqaleta. Now remember, these are, this is the generation of people who were refugees. These were the people who were forced to escape from their homes. So it was quite a thing to really uh, rec create the school at a very difficult time in Assyrian history in the 1920s. You know, the First World War had just ended in 1918. Assyrians had escaped from Urmia, the Hakkari, and other places, and were centered in Mosul, as well as other places in Iraq, but centered in, in the Mosul area. And here, instead of simply languishing uh, without an education and focusing strictly on uh, making a living, uh, you know, Qash Yosef Qaleta and others really strive, strove, I should say, to recreate what had been known in Urmia in the beginning in the uh, 18 or 19th century uh, with the missionary efforts and pushed for learning and the creation of the school. And this uh, helped to educate the Assyrian people during this time, during this very difficult period in Assyrian history. So what was taught at the school? English and Assyrian, uh, taught by Apram Qaleta, who is uh, Yosef's son, Qash Yosef's son. Uh, history and science was taught by Benjamin Arsanis early on. English, Assyrian, and Arabic, taught by Qasha Oraham. And uh, in 1923, uh, English taught by Qasha uh, Alexander Dibaz. Uh, music was also taught, scouting, uh, and other um, subjects were taught, uh, grammar, Assyrian grammar, in particular geography, taught by uh, Qashio Sabqaleta and so on. And Qashio Sabqaleta wrote a number of books. He published uh, over 22 books. Many of them were um, the printing of manuscripts, essentially, uh, of church books, which became used much later on and which were used to educate Assyrians and books on grammar. So 22 books that were published, um, and he really kept alive the heritage of the Church of the East through his efforts by publishing these books and uh, distributing them, um, established uh, the school in 1921, not 1925, uh, taught hundreds of Assyrian students, and who later taught hundreds of others. Um, and there he is with, again, with his trusty assistant, Shamashi Givargis Benyamin of Ashitha, who was one of his most loyal students. And there are many stories concerning how he taught, with what passion he taught, and how seriously he took the teaching of the Assyrian language because he felt it was going to be disappear disappearing. And so Shamashi Givargis, after he passed away, uh, Shamashi Givargis wrote a poem about Qashi Yosef Qaleta, and in his poem, he tells us in one, one line, I will read uh, from it, Ptikhli madrashta qabnunit umte, muliple l'alayme yulpanit ite, min kulli dunyat aturt edana, jmilun yalupit qani yulpana. He opened the school for the sons of his nation, taught the youth the teachings of his church from the entire world of Assyria at the time, gathered students to obtain learning. If you recall in one of the earlier classes, one of the American missionaries is told by an Assyrian bishop, if you just start schools here, there is no nation that is so interested in learning as we are. And, and the Assyrians, again, during the difficult times after the First World War, showed how much they love learning and recreated um, the setting of 
uh, literature that was created in Urmia in, in the 1920s in Iraq after the First World War. So very important to know that in the 1950s, a great contribution to the Assyrian literature, now we're going to Iran, was in the 1950s. Um, and it was through something called the Assyrian Youth Cultural Society, although I recall uh, one member telling me early on, it was very funny that we called it Sita Daleime because many of these uh, youth were actually very old people, but they loved literature so much that they stuck around and really did everything possible to maintain Assyrian literature during this time. So who are these people? And, and we have uh, scholars who, um, uh, Rudolf Matsuch, who mentions them, uh, and I will just mention some names here. And one of them is Shmuel Yosef Betkolia, who passed away in 1975. And he is the one who I referred to the story of Sapar Qashish Sliwu Shmeya, Journey of the Priest uh, Sliwu to Heaven, uh, which was published in 1962 in Tehran. Um, and he writes uh, much about the hypocrites of errors of superstition and poetry and he has left behind several manuscripts, which are currently being worked on to see if these manuscripts could turn into um, literary creations that we can all share and all read, and we can also translate. Um, also, Lilia Taimurazi uh, wrote much in terms of children's literature and folk folklore. Uh, Dr. Pira Sermas, um, again, a very prolific writer of Assyrian who wrote Tashitat Saprayutet Aturaya or Atureta, Tashitat Saprayutet Atureta, History of Assyrian Literature in three volumes. And the third volume is the most interesting because that focuses on modern and lists every single person that he has known about. Um, and, and you could imagine how difficult this is during the time when we were not able to Google search anyone Dr. Pira Sermas, who was a physician, um, went ahead and wrote a three volume book that focused on various people in Assyrian literature and talks about many of these uh, well known uh, people. Baba Bitlachin, um, I'll just mention here um, Ishaya Shamasha Dawud, who wrote Tashitid Bitnahren Ashur Babel. This is a a marvelous and large uh, history of our book, Menashe Amira, who wrote Tashitat Atur, um, and also a collection of poems. Tashitat Atur is a very important uh, work of Assyrian history. It's one of the first, along with Ishaya Shamasha Dawud, of the ancient history of the Assyrians being put in the modern Assyrian language. So, a very unique uh, creation. William Sarmas, who is the brother of Dr. Pira Sarmas, um, who is, uh, uh, we are told, one of the most prominent and prolific of Assyrian authors and dramatists and so on, and journalists, um, who died in 1985. And uh, William Daniel, of course, a poet and composer. Um, this is a creative genius who was the author of uh, uh, in English, it's written as Katni sometimes, or I, I prefer to just say Qatina, the great Qatina um, Gabbara, and many literary works, including the very famous song, which I will quote from Nineveh, Nineveh. Dr. Wilson Bidmansur, who is uh, a very politically active person and the editor of the periodical Atur. Uh, Tobia Oraham Givargis, who passed away in California some years ago. One of the greatest magazines that we have, one of the greatest literary creations that we have in Iran, I would say in the entire Assyrian world, is the magazine Gilgamesh. First appeared in April of 1952 and was the most noteworthy publication of the era. Of course, um, Yo Binyamin and his brother Daniel Binyamin um, 
was, were very fascinated with this. Both were great men of literature themselves, Yoel Binyamin and Daniel Binyamin, and uh, a number of, uh, over two decades ago, actually, Daniel Binyamin republished, uh, retyped and republished the entire magazine um, in, in the area of Chicago and uh, dispersed it. And it's now all over the world in a very uh, handsome volume, which I have behind me, by the way. I have two copies left, and I think the Asher Bani Fall Library has copies. But this is a very interesting publication because it really is the cream of the crop in terms of Assyrian literary creations of Nimrud Simono, Adde al Khas, joined by John al Khas, possibly one of the greatest poets among the Assyrians, Zaya bit Zaya, Mishael bit Potros, and others. Again, this is all during the golden age of Assyrian literature in Iran. Articles addressed striking aspects of the national culture and selective studies in the Assyrian heritage. Um, it also provided a, a form for modern Assyrian poetry, brought together Assyrian present, the Christian past, and the ancient glories of Assyria. Ate al did incredible work in translating the Epic of Gilgamesh and Enuma Elish into modern Assyrian from, from European works, really, uh, French, into uh, modern Assyrian. Nimrod Simono, Adde Alchas, John Alchas, uh, and others, mostly others, were all members of the Chaldean church, uh, important to note, and were educated um, in various uh, either Dominican or other Catholic schools. And then we also have uh, William Daniel coming into being in Iran. And William Daniel was one of the most incredible um, uh, Assyrian uh, uh, poets and Assyrian writers who created, uh, and I would say Assyrian activists, although he's less known for that, one of the nationalists among Assyrians, wrote many nostalgic works. Um, his primary education was in missionary schools where he studied the Assyrian language. He also experienced as a child the First World War, uh, later moved to Hamadan in Iran. He began studying music, and he also went to uh, Switzerland where he became an accomplished violinist. He returned to Iran in 1937 and then later uh, left to the United States. Um, he began the work of Qatlina the Great. Now, Qatlina the Great is an Assyrian folkloric um, creation passed down. It's an oral tale passed through various tribes in the Hakkadi. It is usually uh, performed orally in uh, various uh, dialects of Assyrian, including Tiari and Jilu. And William Daniel, in his uh, great work, repeats these dialects, um, whether it is the dialect of Jilu or Tiari or other dialects. And so he, he repeats them. He also, this book, this, this tale um, goes into areas which traditionally are viewed as Chaldean, for example, Elkush and the Hakkari area. And so outside of Urmia, so the nation is being portrayed in the entirety of the epic poem. This is a poem of 7,000 or so verses. And I will just quote from one of the, uh, one area or one, one splice of, of what this tale is telling us. In the battle between Qatina and Shidda, and Shidda is a term that was used by the ancient Assyrians. The ancient Assyrians referred to the Lamasu as the Shiddu, which is a protective um, deity that could also be viewed as demonic, especially after the Assyrians became uh, Christians. Uh, they viewed the ancient gods as, or demons as, obviously, as uh, or angels or protective deities as evil. And so at any rate, there is a battle between Shidda and Qatina. And we are told before the sun sets, before the moon rises, you'll embrace your sons in your arms, our men and maidens. 
Shidda has stolen from us. Their lives are entombed in mountain cliffs. If Shamiram could hear bitterly, would she weep for her kids or her children, captive in their own land? Rage is swelling in my chest. It inflames my body. It burns me like a fire ablaze. If I do not put an end to Shidda, then it is best to lie down and die, as I would not be the son of Gilgamesh, the Ninevite. So you see a lot of themes coming in here from the ancient past. And I originally quoted this passage when we talked about bringing back the ancient Assyrian past in modern Assyrian literature and thinking. But this also encompasses themes like we have to rise and do something. We are in a very difficult state of affairs. So it twists the um, folktale of Patline into something that is more modern. Um, really the creation of William Daniel based on uh, folk, um, an oral tale. One of the creations of William Daniel, which is he is best known for, is the song Nineveh. Um, and there you see his picture um, when he was very emotional. He was being awarded by the Assyrian Academic Society in Chicago circa 1980, early 1980s. And the song is, uh, I'll say some of the lines in Assyrian because they really are, it, it, this does not do this, this poem and this song justice, but William Daniel put the music together with the lyrics and it became quite a hit and has been recreated again and again by many Assyrian performers all the way until just, I think a year ago, it has been re-sung. Let me fall upon your earth, although the um, original Assyrian is naplin al sadrach on your breast, although of course he's referring to Nineveh. Nineveh, the queen of creation, Malik Brita. Perchance I shall inhale from your soil. A bit of strength for my tired soul. Let me at your ruins gaze or stare and kiss your ancient buildings with passion. Tell me, O burnt rock, the tale of victory. Perhaps it will awaken me, skida, or tired. I left it there, uh, Asqida, the tired soul. Perhaps fear will leave me. The legacy of our mother is this, sons of the plain and of the mountain. Let us unite in one strength and love so that our link is truthful and strong. Preach to the nation, my son. Meshchit ka umta qabne umta bruni. Next to old Nineveh, a new Nineveh. Build a new Nineveh. Uh, and whoever and whenever you are tired, come lie upon my earth. And imantit shurshiyata al dipni gini, gather strength from the mighty. This song um, has been performed, as I said early on, worldwide, um, all over the Assyrian world. And it is one of William Daniel's most uh, beautiful creations. Switching again to Iraq, Giwergis uh, Bet Benyamin, Shamasha Giwergis, also was a nationalist in addition to being a deacon in the Church of the East, was an Assyrian who is a nationalist and was, had lived in Urmia, had, um, had been educated under Rashi Yosef Kaleta, and was a prolific writer of uh, the Assyrian language. Much of his work is poetry, although he's also the author of books, for example, on the visit of Mar'i Shimon. We will quote from his book when we talk about Mar'i Shimon's visit to Iraq. Here he writes a poem that is very interesting, Manina Aturai, who are the Assyrians? And he goes, and it's a very fun um, sort of reading of who are the Assyrians. He he refers to different groups and kind of pulls them in as one nation. And he refers to each group with its own sort of characteristic. And, and he is, of course, an admiring characteristic. 
if we're talking about the Tiari who from centuries has protected his freedom, Marda uh, who is uh, or the Tuma who is very brave in his heart and his um, dignity. In Baznaya, Mare Shemha Umanute, or the people of Baz who are known for their artistry, Umanute. Yen Jilwaya, Mshemhab Umta, Blachimute, or the Jilu who is known for his uh, handsome uh, features. Yen Dernaya, Tlema Sachsarwach, El Parushute, or Dernaya, and this Dernaya are. Daranaya are the people in Shmizdin, uh, another term. The Urmis would refer to them as Shapatnaya. Daranaya Tlema Sachsarwach El Parishute. We cannot deny his intelligence, the Daranaya. Yan Bne Umtan Urmijnaye Ptamimute. Yan Bne Umtan Urmijnaye Ptamimute. The Urmi is complete. The people of Urmia are complete, according to Shamasha. Givargis and so on, and then he goes into other people, and then and then he tells us at the end. They are all speaking in one language, Aturait, Assyrian language, and they are all the sons and daughters of one nation um, through their origin. Shamasha Givargis also would write very interesting critiques and lessons uh, in one of his poems uh, reproduced by uh, Pira Sarmas, uh, Dr. Pira Sarmas. He tells us, Inqa umta u shotaputa la masat pelchit u gyu chazina, yon chazino, gyu chazina upchaf pilsa la masat darit. Bush spy ila min kulbindi shatkit shitka hamet ub aine ptiche il anit pelchi achchi geshkit. If your na if for your nation or society you cannot labor and in its treasury one penny contribute, it's better that you keep silent from all things and with eyes wide open upon those who labor only observe. There are a lot of this type of um, Assyrian literature, poetry, that uh, Giorgis Agassi is also known for, who was born in Hamadan. And he is one of the, I would say, probably the most prolific writer among the Assyrians when it comes to poetry. He's written over 200 poems uh, for his brother, Ivan Agassi, so perhaps 200, perhaps much more than that even. And he also has translated many books into the Assyrian language and translated from the Assyrian into other languages. Um, and there's a whole debate as to how many works Givargis Agassi has created. But one thing is absolutely without a doubt, and that is that the man is a talented, one of the most talented poets that we have. And this is a translation from his poem, Letter uh, to God. I wrote a letter, I wrote letter after letter in your name, O Creator. Again, I send you another letter. Listen to our voice, O Creator. You are the giver of hope. I send you a letter on behalf of every believer. I wrote a letter, I wrote letter after letter in your name, O Creator. Again, I send you another letter. Our hope resembles the waves of the sea, our faith upon the Creator. Do not allow the work of your hands to become the work of others. And of course, this is just one of many of his creations. Uh, Givargis Agassi is, again, a very prolific writer. Um, I should have said this before in terms of Adde Alchas and John Alchas, who were two of the greatest um, among the uh, many great people writing in what we call the during the time of the Assyrian golden age of literature in Iran. Uh, these two brothers, 
founded the Assyrian uh, printing house named Hunain, and they published uh, the magazine Gilgamesh, as, and, and we referred uh, to this. And according to Rudolf uh, Masuch, um, in Assyrians in Iran, in uh, Encyclopedia Iranica, um, Adde Alchas in his Gilgamesh magazine, as I said before, wrote a modern version of uh, Assyrian poetry of the epic of Gilgamesh, which was translated from one of the Western nations and Enuma Elish, uh, which appeared in installments in the periodical. And later they were turned into a book, um, which again was retranslated, I believe, by another Assyrian. And I, and I think it is Kasha Shmuel in California. Uh, I don't recall his last name, and I apologize for that. Um, also, uh, one of the authors tells us, uh, Masuch actually, uh, they succeeded in purifying the modern Assyrian idiom of, from Turkish and Kurdish words, replacing them with classical expressions and creating a more elegant literary style. And uh, John Alchas in particular was known as the exiled poet. And this is from his book, which was published by Nimrod Simono. Um, actually, this is from uh, the magazine Gilgamesh, and, and uh, uh, which is the constant term that he, this reflects the Assyrian experience is Trida, the exiled. Uh, so he is known as the exiled poet, uh, Poeta Trida. And from the memories of the exiled, he writes, your footsteps, each day that passes, this grass turns greener and covers your memory from this world, hurry and return, Melies Dor. On rainy April, every evening you would say, there it went, and from our lives this time shall not be repeated, hurry and return. John al has started a new style of poetry. His poetry contains a lot of meaning in very few words. And it is very interesting to see also his nationalism. John Alchas was a member of the Chaldean church and had been um, involved in a number of groups. Uh, he was uh, a member of the which was the Assyrian uh, literature uh, group or organization in uh, Taurus, uh, Tabriz, Iran in 1925. Um, John Alchas was a member along with uh, William Sermas, uh, the brother of Pira Sermas. After two years, uh, unfortunately, there was a split in the organization and another sub-organization or smaller organization was created in the name of Nasibin. And Nimrod Simono, kind of a off the cuff remark, says, as is naturally the case among us Assyrians, uh, that you know we split from various organizations. Um, Hannibal al Khas, the famous Hannibal al Khas, the artist and poet among Assyrians, is um, the nephew, the son of Adde al Khas, and the nephew of John al Khas. And he tells us um, in his eulogy of John al Khas, his life passed as a poor man with difficulties. And, and Hannibal al Khas had the style of writing that was very, very realistic. And, and uh, no matter what um, he, he wrote, he wrote it with a type of um, kind of honest expression or truthful expression of, of what the situation was. So instead of simply praising, he tells us that his life passed as a poor man with difficulties and he lost in all things, except in his love for his nation, his language and his literature, Saprayuta. Yes, my uncle John, among poets who have come and gone, your head will be held high. Rishuk Paish Rama. And there you see in the photograph, uh, to the right is Nimrod Simono, and um, to his right is um, Hannibal Alchas uh, at the grave of his uncle, uh, John Alchas. And Hannibal Alchas told me personally that he wrote a poem about 
uh, John Ulchas, which I wish we could locate. It may be in manuscript form, it may be in published form, but I haven't seen it yet. Mamoni Kamula Gibberuch, my uncle, why did you not marry? And it's it's a longer poem, obviously, um, but it's about the tragic tragic life of John Alchas. So the history of Assyrian literature was written by Pira Sermas, as we mentioned before, and Pira Sermas uh, did a marvelous job with documenting Saprayuta uh, Atureta, not only in Iran, but throughout the world in the United States. He documented various writers, gave samples in his book of the various writers uh, early on and all the way up until 1970. In Iraq, across the border from Iran. In 1968, the Assyrians began to go through a new phase of Arabism. Now, the Assyrians would have to, after the Semele period, even become more careful about maintaining their language, their culture, their heritage uh, than in the past, because Arab nationalism was here to compete with any type of competing nationalism that may come to the fore. This was also the year of the creation of the Assyrian Universal Alliance, sparked mostly from the efforts of the Assyrians in Iran, the people who were uh, so vested in literature, uh, created this organization. One could say it's really their efforts in 1968 in Pau, France, and it spread all over the world. And we will be talking more about the Assyrian Universal Alliance when we talk about political bodies, its successes and failures. And of course, the Assyrian Universal Alliance, not to get into too much uh, of this topic here, but uh, was involved in Iraq in negotiating with Ahmed Hassan al-Bakr, the president of Iraq, but it uh, really had a way of exaggerating um, its activities, one could say, or its uh, um, really uplifting Assyrian hopes was the goal, but it was, uh, um, their efforts were largely um, exaggerated. In 1972, after the Iraqi government uh, secured its position vis-a-vis uh, -vis other parties that were involved in Iraq and the Kurds, as well as the Kurds, the rights of what are known as the Mataqeen bil Lugha Syriania, Hamzaman of Lishanat Surat, were um, given to uh, various people who were labeled as Assyrians, Chaldeans, and Syriacs. So these were all Syriac speakers to the Iraqi government. Again, remember, this is done during Ba'athist uh, times, and so Ba'athist philosophy, Arabism, thrives and speakers of one particular language is easier to say than members of a this or that nation. Now, when it came to the Kurds, of course, a different, um, the Kurds had much more of a violent veto power, as it were, than the Assyrians. The Assyrians were not able to muster as many uh, fighters as, for example, the Kurds. And so the reference to the Assyrians is the speakers of this particular language. And, and so the Assyrians did have rights, but eventually these attempts to advertise that the Ba'athists were giving the Assyrians rights were really came to naught. And uh, um, it was largely a failed effort. Uh, and the stations and the other efforts that were created were predominated by the Ba'athists and this um, effort of Assyrians to bring back their literature in a more forceful way um, really fell apart as far as being supported and recognized by the government after the 1970s. Hostilities between the Kurds and the Iraqi government rose. Some of the Assyrians supported the Kurdish movement. Um, there were, of course, um, many Assyrians who actually were part of the Kurdish movement. And we'll talk about this when we talk about the formation of political body bodies in, in Iraq specifically. 
uh, as the Assyrian Democratic Movement. And so uh, as part of the Kurdish effort, um, the Kurdistan effort, the Assyrians were defeated by the Iraqi government. The Kurds were defeated, thousands died. And eventually, um, although they, the Kurds were supposedly supported by the United States in the form of Kissinger, and then supported by the Shah in Iran, that fell apart when there was an agreement made between the Shah of Iran and the Iraqi government um, in what is known as the Algiers Agreement. And that ended the support for the Kurds. And that was the end of the Kurdish effort. And everything was stifled from that period of time until, of course, a later period. So the Assyrian publications that were published in Iraq largely were religious early on. Lisan al mashriq for example, from the Syriac Orthodox Church, and al najm from the Chaldean Church, and there were others in 1973, Qala Suryaya, from the Assyrian uh, or Syriac Cultural Association, uh, Bain Nahrain Quarterly. And in these, you could see references to the ancient past, but but one must be very careful not to stress that too much, because there was a great deal of fear among many Assyrians that asserting this ancient identity is going to cause you problems with the Arab nationalists within the Ba'ath Party. And in fact, the Assyrian performers that performed, such as Dawud Isha, uh, Shlimun Bichmuel, and uh, Albert Oscar Baba, actually suffered, uh, in particular Daoud Isha and uh, Albert Oscar Baba, and were imprisoned in the 1970s for singing nationalistic songs. Nevertheless, there was a magazine called Murdunna Aturaya that ran between 1974 to 1991 by the Assyrian Cultural uh, Club. And there you see the image of one of the first ones, which is uh, one of the early ones which is uh, a reference to ancient, this is again bringing back the ancient Assyrian culture, claiming the ancient Assyrian heritage. Now, you must remember, it's interesting to point out that in Iraq, the modern Assyrians were referred to as Athuriyin or Athuriyun, and the ancient Assyrians were referred to as Ashuriyin. So the sheen for the ancient Assyrians, the th sound for the modern Assyrians. And so oftentimes there was distinguishing between these two, although really the words <clears throat> mean the same thing. Now what's comical about that is in Syria, the opposite is true. When you say Athuri, you're referring to the ancient past. When you say Ashuri, you are referring really to the members of the Church of the East for some, for some reason. So the literary style of, of various performers, and I want to get into some of the th singers who, who um, reflected the modern Assyrian experience. And one of them, um, one of the most uh, well-known is, uh, is Iwan Agassi, one of the performers who is well-known. Um, and he sings the song, and I've quoted a little bit from it to kind of give you a sense of the Assyrian experience. And I, I want you to hear if we have time, I'm going to go a little bit fast now because I want you to hear kind of the flavor of these songs because translating them doesn't really do justice. But you see the song Awara, which was written in 1959 by Daniel ben Benjamin and performed by Iwan Agassi in one of his earlier records is, I am a stranger in this world, awaremen, yuda dunya. I have no home of my own. Why did I part from my home and fell far from my relatives? Enough draining my blood, my wounded heart, do not torture me. Tears of longing pour out from the eyes of my mother. I am afraid that I will lose my name and existence. My heart tells me that my days will be bitter, where in this world, O oh, oh Lord, will I find myself? Where do I go? Where do I find a solution? What do I do to find a solution? So this is just a, to give you an idea of what Assyrians were singing about. There are many, many of these types of songs and poems, and I could not possibly reproduce 
um, a good sample of them for you. But this gives you an idea. Again, Biba across the, the border from Iran um, sings the song, Saparchiwin, a traveler. Traveler am I, alone I travel. This, this song came out in the 60s. A stranger have I become lost to my goal. Why, O oh Lord, the miseries of this world have only remained for this heart. O oh, my poor soul, a thousand laments upon you. How tired are you with bitter pains? I take steps to, unknown, to an unknown road, lost in th thoughts in this world, this world of estrangements. My tears filled with longing, the pains of my heart are tied to dignity. All of my life full of sorrow, resembling the ruins of Nineveh, I have thus remained in, the, in this world like a bird away from its nest. Um, and so, very so sad. And now um, I turn to Albert Temeris again in the same theme. And um, I want to ask Esther if you can just play just a couple of minutes to kind of end our um, presentation today. So, and Esther, before you do that, I'm going to just uh, quote in English, of course, from uh, this song, O time, Yazona, why are you persecuting us? Hamud Bazlama Allah, why are we, we are but guests in this world. Let us pass in peace and in kindness. Do not leave us shattered in this world. O world, O world, O world. Lamenting. So these are the songs of modern Assyrians that, that convey a deep sense of sorrow, and it is really a mirror of the experience that Assyrians went through of being uh, stateless, of having endured the genocide, of having um, understood the experiences of their parents and their grandparents who went through the very difficult years of the First World War and afterwards of estrangement and dispersion all over the world. Um, Sarah, are you able to play this, um, just a clip from this song so we can share the kind of ambiance with the class? Yeah, sure. Let me pull it up right now. Okay, this is Albert Tamras, who's singing live in Syria in 1974. So I want you to get a feeling for what this sounds like to you. Go ahead, Esther, or Sarah, excuse me. Just 
That's good. That's good. Um, okay. Sorry. Um, I just wanted you to hear that because really sharing that with you gives you a sense of the pain and suffering that Assyrians went through. And uh, it's a reflection that is now embedded in, in various creative works of Assyrians. That was from the 1970s. But that type of an Assyrian um, expression of pain and suffering from the First World War is very common in many of the performances. Now, Albert Tamara sings kind of in a old classical, traditional Eastern way, uh, but that is also uh, portrayed in uh, various songs as, as you saw in Iwan Agassi and also Ashur Bitsergis and others. Um, Biba, who was uh, uh, whose name was Edward Hughes.